Um, well, I'll go ahead and get started and we'll see if, if some more folks join us or not. I know we had um, many people register for the meeting and some people um, may have been coming from the car plenary and take a little bit longer to join us. So we'll just keep uh, monitoring all of that. Um, but I do want to start by by welcoming everyone to the 2021 CARA meeting. I'm Ann Lester. I'm the outgoing chair of CARA this year. Uh, and I'm thrilled to welcome so many of you. Um, I know sort of statistically, this was going to be one of our largest CARA meetings. And we'll, we'll again, we'll see how the room fills in. Certainly, we're doing, I think, great for now. Um, so that's exciting. And I'm really grateful that people made time um, out of their busy lives uh, at home <laughs> for a meeting like this on a Sunday. So thank you. I also want to start by um, thanking uh, uh, you. I'm not sure. Yes, I see Kalani there uh, and her amazingly heroic efforts facilitating the whole MAA meeting, which has just been really spectacular. Um, I'm so impressed and to have done it so well, uh, again, over, over these digital platforms uh, is just um, so fantastic and inspiring and really speaks to, I think, the kinds of things that, that CARA is also committed to going forward in terms of keeping us all connected uh, and networked, no matter what the challenge is. Uh, I also want to thank, thank Lisa Fagan Davis and Chris Cole, who's here, who um, have done so much to facilitate this meeting in so many different ways. Um, and, and Chris has done so much for CARA to um, help us keep all the registration and everything running um, smoothly. So thank you very much. Uh, and I will say more about this in my introductory comments, but I also just especially want to thank the CARA executive committee as a whole this year, um, who has been so fantastic. It is a, a great sadness. I mean, I've liked every iteration of the committee I have worked with, but it is a great sadness that um, at the end of one's term, once you kind of help in the process, uh, facilitate a fantastic group of people, you then have to leave that group of people. So I, I am sad to, to do that, but I am also just, uh, I want to recognize them and, and thank them for the very impressive and ongoing hard work meeting throughout this past year. Um, so thank you all. Uh, I do want to do a bit of CARA business. This is technically our business meeting, so I'm going to just speak for a very few minutes about some of those technical things before going on and talking about the meeting itself. Um, first, I'm happy to announce that the MAA Council has approved um, our new CARA executive members, and we're very thrilled to, to welcome them. Nahir uh, Otano Gracia, who's here, uh, maybe you can raise your hand, yes, and Matthew Vernon, welcome. <laughs> um, you have both, even before you You've been officially approved, been instrumental in, in thinking through so much that CARA has done this year and into the future. So thank you. And I'm thrilled to announce the new CARA chair who will take over as soon as this meeting ends, Sean Gilsdorf. So thank you. Uh, and uh, it's exciting to think about where, where things will go. Um, so a few um, sort of updates and business items that I want to call people's attention to um, going forward. Uh, things that were just decided even yesterday in our car executive meeting. Um, first, I want to let you know that this meeting is being recorded. Uh, the whole time and that we will do our best. I'm going to ask, I should have mentioned this before, but Lisa and Chris to try to do this, which is to make the closed captioning available to, to all of our members, because that, that's important as well, if we can do that. Um, we will also keep the Q&A, particularly when we're together as a large group and specifically at the end, we will keep that open, the Q&A function and the chat, um, which is, let's see, we don't, so we're going to go through the chat because I see Every Zoom meeting is configured differently. So there's not a Q&A listed at the bottom uh, of my panel here, but the chat is there. And the executive committee members will glance over when they're not talking. And I think Lisa in particular will monitor that, especially when it comes time to ask questions. I will look and take questions at the very end of the meeting when our panel wraps up. But I wanna make that um, available to you. And in case people haven't found it, the chat is down at the very bottom of your Zoom screen there. Once you bring your cursor down, it will pop up. Um, I also want to let you know that um, shortly after our meeting convenes, within the coming week or so, um, everyone who registered for the meeting will receive a Google form asking for your contact information so that CARA going forward can begin to compile um, a list that it can use 
in the future to be in touch with you, but also to keep CARA affiliates networked. Um, this has been something a Deserata for a long time, and we're going to try a pilot program using our digital tools to be able to do that. So please look out for that and please respond. It'll be available to you on multiple different platforms, but we'll come over email first. Um, another thing I wanted to call attention to, and I'm very glad to see Catherine Beebe's here, um, is that although I announced the CARA prizes on Friday, and congratulations to our winners for the teaching prize and service prize, um, to a number of students who won uh, CARA scholarships, um, the CAR CARA also offers a CARA conference grant. Um, and uh, Katie uh, uh, and her program won it in 2019 and held their conference in 2020. And Katie's going to take a minute to update us. Please, let's see, Katie, can you unmute yourself and go ahead? Hi, thank you, everyone. Um, so in 2019-2020, I served as the president of the Texas Medieval Association, or TEMA. And TEMA is very grateful to CARA and the Medieval Academy for the grant that supported our 30th annual meeting, which we held in October of 2020. Uh, because of the pandemic, it was entirely virtual, but despite that, or maybe because of it, we welcomed more than 80 participants from three different continents, four different countries, and 15 different states from coast to coast, which is kind of different for a Texas regional conference. The theme was medieval STEAM, that is including the arts alongside science, technology, engineering, and math. And Professor Allison Beach of the University of St. Andrews gave the keynote address entitled The Medieval Woman with Lapis Lazuli in Her Teeth, an Interdisciplinary Detective Story. We also inaugurated a permanent strand of linked thematic sessions on race and medieval studies that will be a part of all future meetings. We had intended that the CARA conference grant would help fund travel bursaries for independent and junior scholars and to help alleviate the cost of family, child, and elder care for conference attendees. But because of the virtual nature of the conference, even before vaccines were available, travel bursaries were not needed. And although we advertised, no one applied for the financial assistance for dependent care. We're also therefore very grateful to both CARA and the Medieval Academy for allowing us to hold on to the prize money to use when we have our next in-person conference, which that's looking like maybe uh, not until the fall of 2022. But we look forward to that and we wanna express our deepest thanks to this committee for that possibility. Thanks, Katie. And um, Katie is also a fantastic advertisement for the prize because we got no applications this past year. Um, so please, please do consider applying. Uh, we want to continue to grow, uh, rather, sorry, I said prize, but it's a grant. Um, and uh, we need your applications to do that. So um, as, as folks in charge of programs, please keep that in mind for the future. Um, I also want to call attention to uh, the Supporting Medievalist Best Practices for Centers and Regional Associations document, which was compiled last year following the ad hoc committee's meeting, and, and which we spoke about a little bit at the last CAR meeting. Um, that document, which has been linked in the chat, will now um, live on the CARA tab on the medieval website, uh, the, medieval, the MAA's website. If you go to the website, CARA has its own tab. And in that drop down menu, we will put that document up there. Um, is a document that I want us to keep in mind today as we um, speak in our breakout rooms and as we think about um, best practices for supporting all medievalists, affiliated, unaffiliated, <laughs> in different programs, et cetera, going forward. So um, I, I, we put the link there. Again, the document will continue to be available. And it's something that we'll keep talking about um, for CARA in general. And I know, Laura Morelli, you were instrumental in writing that document and thinking about um, all the work that committee accomplished last year. So thank you. So I want to take a few minutes now um, to say a few words about this year's meeting theme, its format, and what we hope to accomplish. Uh, the topic of this year's meeting surviving and thriving through a time of crisis, conversations on envisioning medieval studies at the close of the centenary, um, is a topic that uh, we sort of, it evolved over time and was envisioned coming out of and response to the past year and its innumerable challenges, professionally, personally, structurally, and for medieval studies in particular. And this year's meeting, uh, the, the design of it, the thinking around it was long in the works. We started last year after the conclusion of the previous CARA meeting in the spring, uh, thinking about ideas and conversations, and that continued throughout the fall. Initially, our thinking was inspired by the conversations and dialogues convened in 2020 
by the MA's Inclusivity and Diversity Committee and the Folger Library's Critical Race Conversations, among many other sort of, um, webinars that were available speaking to the question of diversity, race, and inclusion, and the challenges that medieval studies in particular might have in relation to some of these questions. Um, and we thought carefully about how to adopt some of those formats for a future CARA meeting. Um, but as the year went on, as the challenges of the pandemic presented greater um, uh, hardships, um, issues, disconnections, uh, frustrations, alienation even, as our own political system was challenged in various ways, we kept realizing that our questions kept shifting. The kinds of challenges that different medieval programs and medievalists ourselves were facing kept shifting and changing. Um, so I really want to say that this meeting has been put together truly as a cumulative and collective effort. Um, the entire executive committee met often to talk about the format and the questions we wanted to bring together and to think about how it might be helpful, useful, even provocative for our attendees and affiliates to attend a meeting that took a slightly different format from what we were used to. We also recognize that this Zoom meeting followed uh, on three days of intensive medieval uh, studies, uh, you know, formal papers and sitting and listening a lot. So we, we thought bringing in the dialogue component, a conversation exchange was really important. Um, so recognizing that CARA members offer different sets of experiences and expertise, we thought to learn from each other about how we've experienced the past year differently in our different locales facing very different challenges. So our local worlds, as they responded to national changes and national issues. And we wanted to use this as a chance to begin to re-envision the future of medieval studies and to consider how CARA can work to support all medievalists, whether in academic positions or working outside the academy, to stay connected and to consider how we could indeed thrive in the future. And that's a component of this, I think, whole meeting that we wanna keep in mind. So that's what sort of motivated our decision to begin with smaller breakout groups. And these, these breakout rooms um, will be managed and will go on for about 30 minutes. I'm gonna stop talking in just a minute or two. Uh, so we will be split into different breakout rooms and afterwards we will reconvene and hear from a panel of discussants uh, about some of their own particular experiences during that this past year. Um, that will help us think about what it means to survive and to thrive in this environment. At the end of that panel, we'll then have about 15 minutes for open questions as a group. Um, and we'll begin to think about some, some takeaways for the future. So I, I wanna stress a few things before we are broken up into our, our separate breakout rooms. First, all the rooms will have a CARA Executive Committee member present. And let me just introduce them now, if you can just raise your hand. Uh, Laura Moriale, uh, Fiona Griffith, Nahir Otana Gracia, Matthew Vernon, Renee Trilling, Sean Gilsdorf, and myself. So you'll be in a room with one of us. <laughs> We are there to manage the room. I think that is the best word I can think of at this point, um, but we are not trained facilitators or moderators. We certainly are not trained to address complex contemporary issues and we make no claims to such expertise. But we did feel that these conversations, even just raising the questions together is a really important exercise uh, worth taking up. Second, given the time, we don't expect that every group will tackle every question. And we do want to have time to introduce ourselves. Um, and also at the very end, to think about some takeaways that your CAR representative can bring back to the CAR Executive Committee as we think about moving forward. So finally, before we sort of break up, um, in opening up the meeting to a conversation, particularly a meeting this size, even if we are in smaller rooms, this means hearing different opinions and perspectives but we are all here having recognized that we agree to the MAA's policies on professional behavior. Um, that was linked originally in the CARA program and I think is linked here in the chat. Um, so we will, we will go forward, uh, I think with the spirit of um, cooperation and seeking to learn from each other uh, in a respectful and open-minded way. 
so as I've been talking, I think Lisa has been breaking us into randomized breakout rooms, <laughs> which we will now be sent to. If I understand how all this works, and it sounds like some cross between Harry Potter and the Matrix, <laughs> we sort of inserted into these rooms, find ourselves with a smaller group of people, talk for about 25 minutes or so, we will be given a warning that our breakout group will end. <laughs> and then even if we are mid-sentence, having not been able to say goodbye, we will be zoomed back <laughs> and dropped in among uh, the larger group at 1.45, at which time we'll be able to turn off our cameras and microphones, take a small break, because uh, we all are human still, even if in this virtual world. And we will formally reconvene at 2 o'clock for our panel where we will hear from uh, our four speakers today. Um, so we will I, will, I will formally introduce them and introduce that panel when we return at two o'clock. Okay, well then um, let me welcome everyone back. And I, I know sort of anecdotally, there may be some more people who join us. So I think at least that you're watching, we'll just keep an eye on this and, uh, and invite people back in. Um, well, I hope that the conversations um, were productive as anticipated. I suspect everyone only was able to, to touch on a fraction of the issues that we brought up. But again, um, I hope that those questions as well as um, the document about um, supporting all medievalist best practices for centers and regional associations can, can stay on people's radars going forward. Um, and the uh, executive committee is gonna meet following this um, to talk about um, what what was talked about in our breakout rooms and think about um, things that we can we can do to uh, address as far as we're able some of the things that were brought up in those conversations. So thank you all for for boldly pursuing this with us. <laughs> um, we'll see where we go. Um, now that we're reconvened, I'm very pleased to introduce the speakers in our um, panel discussion talking about surviving and thriving during this challenging year. And what I'm going to do because each of their comments will last about 10 minutes. Um, and they interlock in, 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 in various ways, um, not intentionally, but I, I would like to, us to hear from um, each of them one after another. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce formally all four of them right now so that we can hear um, from them in turn. And I will sort of turn the, turn the speaker view over to each of them as we go. Um, and we're very pleased to have all four of them here with us to share some reflections and thoughts about um, this past year, perhaps experiences even before this year, um, and, and ways forward. So our first speaker will be Valerie Wilhite, and Dr. Wilhite has a PhD in comparative literature. She works generally on the literature in Romance languages, and more particularly on the troubadours. She's held VAP positions at Miami University, the University of Oregon, before taking a tenure track position at the University of the Virgin Islands, that she was forced to give up when hurricanes made it impossible to continue. And since then, she's been living and working in Colombia. After that, we will hear from Nicole Lopez Jansen. She is an associate professor of history at the City University of New York and the borough of Manhattan Community College. And her interests include race and gender in the early medieval Mediterranean and anti-racist pedagogy. She's been involved in conversations about undergraduate teaching at several conferences, from the Community College Humanities Association to the American Historical Association and Kalamazoo. We'll also hear from Gina Brandolino, who is a lecturer at the University of Michigan, jointly appointed in the Department of English and the Sweetland Center for Writing. And she teaches and writes about medieval literature, horror, comics, and working class writing. And finally, we'll hear from Maura Fitzbond, who is a professor of English at Marist College, where she, uh, where her teaching and research interests include medieval literature, disability studies, and comics. And while we'll hear from them separately, I also wanted to say that Maura and Gina are co-directors of Medieval Meets Modern, a series hosted on the website Middle Ages for Educators, which we could possibly put into the chat. Um, a link to that uh, website, which was pioneered this past year and has many, many, many resources available. And Medieval Meets Modern explores options for teachers to place medieval texts in dialogue with contemporary works, including horror films, children's literature, and comics. It's really fantastic. Do, do check it out. I want to put a plug in for that. Um, so let's um, turn first to Valerie Wilhite. Valerie, if you want to turn on... 
Okay, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. So I was asked to participate in order to bring the perspective of a scholar who has found herself outside academia with the idea that I could address what we need to remain active in scholarship. So my concern for today is the production of scholarship for the good of the field, because I believe in the importance of the humanities and medieval studies. So I begin from the idea that the loss of scholars is a loss of scholarship that harms the objectives of the field. There's a definition of science that I think works for medieval studies. It says it is a complex, self-organizing and evolving network of scholars, projects, papers, and ideas. So if we lose scholars, the network shrinks. If we lose scholars, the projects, papers, and ideas they would have produced are not added to that web of knowledge. If we lose scholars, those who remain do not have the work they would have done on which to stand. So lately we've seen a lot of articles addressing the effects of COVID on women and people of color. And New York Times title asks, could the pandemic prompt an epidemic of loss of women in the sciences? So the article focuses on women scholars' feelings, the loss of knowledge, the impact of the loss of their work doesn't seem to have even occurred to the author. And other articles also suggest that scholarship done by women or people of color doesn't move the field forward. It serves only to move the underrepresented scholar forward for the personal benefit of that scholar, for their self-esteem. So I want to just imagine for a moment that the work done by individuals pushes the scholarship of the field along. So I'm gonna use a funny image here. Let's imagine we are working towards the cure for cancer. Imagine we have 100 people working diligently on a cure for cancer. If we lose 75 of those 100, we should worry that we only have 25 people left working on curing cancer. So I'd like for us to try to imagine our web of scholarship or our field in that way. So for today, my premise is the loss of scholars is the loss of valuable scholarship necessary for the good of the field. And I have two anecdotes for you. So a million years ago, I studied in Paris and I um, was at a lecture uh, where Rudy Imbach began by asking, how many university chairs of medieval philosophy are there in all of France? And from the back of a room, a young boy yelled out, la vôtre, just yours. So his point, Mbach's point was the dire straits of the field. That was what he wanted to stress. And then he said the most important scholar, Alain de Libera, had no university chair. Yes, it was that long ago. He had no university chair, he had no chair. He was working at the Ecole Pratique, the section of religion. So not philosophy at all. Second anecdote, a few years back, the journal Tenso, which is the journal for those of us who work in Occitan, Troubadours, the like, the journal had more necrologies than articles. There were more mm, obituaries, let's say, than there were articles. I think the number was five to three. As vice president of the Société Gimna, I suggested, are we dead yet? As the topic for our next conference sessions. It was not well received. So we're aware of the terrifying statistics about academia, higher ed, jobs, so I'm going to skip over those. I'll say that it has been said that COVID-19 stands to drive out more PhDs from academia than any event in living memory. And crises, be they political or economic or born of natural disasters, they're going to continue. So my question is, can we salvage scholarship even if higher ed tanks? What is the role of academia in the production of scholarship? 
University departments are a place where a small number of professors do research and a large number of grad students do research until they graduate or until they become adjuncts who do research until they leave the profession. We have what Milojevic and others have called a temporary workforce. They say that it is a temporary workforce because the time over which half of the cohort has left the field has shortened from 35 years to only five years in the 2010s. And funnily enough, neither productivity nor citation impact of early work can serve as a reliable predictor of ultimate survivability. So do we want to lose the scholarship of our lost scholars. I want to learn from it what Imbach asked and said and suggest that we can do research from outside the university, but it's complicated. Where can it happen? So I'll share here a very high tech <laughs> image. So higher ed on one side and on the other entities that I think are academic, close to academic, I'm not sure how to put it, publishing houses, research centers. But a couple of weeks ago in an AHA session called Historical Research Beyond the Professoriate, the speakers hailed from the Department of State, Ancestry.com, RAND. So the bubbles that I have here suggest in and out, places where you can use your knowledge of material and methodology to get a job and maybe even use that in your daily work and maybe even to produce scholarship. But I added that little tail to the chart for research of a different kind, the ancestry.com kind. Because here is a conundrum. You might conduct research. Uh oh, I hear thunder. I might get dropped. <laughs> but do you produce scholarship? Working for Ancestry.com, a panelist explained her daily practice is like grad research. But the facilitator asked her about her own scholarship. The panelist bumbled and finally said, I produce for a client, a paying client. The product is not for the field. The product is for a paying client. So daily practice is research. Your daily work feels good, but it's not necessarily scholarship. And I'll come back to this in a moment. And then there is out, there is in existence, which is where I find myself now, a place where no research happens. So I'm wondering how many PhDs cannot do research at all? The jokes, the memes, the cartoons suggest a lot. If graduate school is an on-ramp to doing research, is there an on-ramp for those who completed grad school but are not in any of these bubbles? Cannot even be counted as independent scholars. So what is a scholar? What is needed? to produce scholarship. I have here a sort of a Maslow's pyramid, but for scholarship, food, water, roof, time. I don't know where to put time in this pyramid. I maybe misplaced it. Computer and Wi-Fi, primary sources, secondary sources. Well, a job covers hopefully the bottom, but it often doesn't leave time for those who are working outside or for even those who are working as adjuncts or doing visiting assistant professorship positions or working at research institutions where maybe they get food, water, roof. They might even have access to necessary resources, but not the time needed to look for materials, engage with the scholarship regularly, reflect, think, much less write. In the case of the person who worked for Ancestry.com, she has resources. Her time is spent doing research, but the fruit isn't hers. So she might be welcome to speak at a conference, but she might not have the right to share what she's learned. And I'm wondering if that's not the case for other, when you work for other entities, maybe auction houses, for example, 
which is something that I was interested in. So I'm left with nothing but frustration and questions. The easiest slices of the pyramid for the scholarly organizations to address is you know, the pointy part of the pyramid, those slices. Which entities could provide access to research resources to people not in academia? Maybe a national coalition of independent scholars that exists. Maybe professional organizations. Maybe one university library in the US could house us all. Or maybe all university libraries could take a slice of us. Or an EU library that is particularly dedicated to open access. What about the Library of Congress? This seems to me the easiest bit and someone will get this done. Access will be achieved. But I have a lot of questions. Should we reconsider who we call independent scholars or even the need for such a title? By entertaining this notion of the independent scholar and working to support their efforts at output, funding for travel to conferences or even publication subsidies, isn't this really just squeezing a few more drops out of them before they inevitably move out into the nail, into nothingness? How can we give longevity to these temporary producers of valuable work? Should we reconsider this in and out division of the bubbles I created? If business people and business mentality have felt comfortable muscling in on our space in the university, cannot, can we not force our way into other sectors of the workforce? Enlarge those bubbles. If networking is how you find a job outside of academe, a major roadblock medieval studies PhDs have to finding external employment, can we do more than simply have our MLA and AHA job lists include non ac jobs? Could there be a task force that goes out and finds places that would do well to hire PhDs and force them to realize that they do need these PhDs? The ADFL advocacy packet is a kind of a model in a way. And these ideas sound far-fetched, but the Collège de France was strong-armed into resurrecting Etienne Gilson's chair for Alain de Libera. Occitan, well, the EU mandated countries foster their minority languages. So now there are Occitan cultural centers opening throughout France, not tied to universities. Here in Colombia, my bank emails me to tell me about Zoom lectures they sponsor by scholars that cover Shakespeare, Ottoman Empire, or Freddie Mercury and Queen. And one of the most exper interesting experiences I've had was offering a course on the troubadours at a school for performers of medieval music. And there are a lot of these schools for performers, historical performance. The London Rare Book School opened as a non-academic place to get knowledge akin to ours because it is valuable in the rare book trade. So fostering relationships, creating more connections, a wider web, a wider network would be at least a start to have a clear idea of where we can do research at least and perhaps even maybe continue contributing to scholarship in medieval studies. Thank you so much, Valerie. That's um, such a valuable way of thinking about it and incredibly valuable insight. Raises lots of questions as you left us with at the very end. Thank you. Um, we'll hear next from Nicole Lopez Jansen. Nicole, can you turn on your camera? Okay, um, we're all here. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little bit about creating cultures of care, um, both with students and with fellow medievalists. Uh, one of the things that has been so disheartening to me in the responses to the pandemic is that it has shown that most of our institutions do not care about us. Um, many faculty members probably felt this way before the pandemic but the immense increase in workload to the transition online and for some then to go high flex, uh, institutions disregard for the health of their faculty and their students in reopening decisions and, and other things have made this even more apparent in a time that's already full of anxiety and uncertainty. Um, this of course affects precarious faculty the most. Uh, CUNY where I work laid off many adjuncts, which also meant that many of them lost health insurance as well as their source of, source of income during the pandemic. CUNY is uni unionized and so um, adjuncts do have faculty if they have a, a certain teaching load. 
Uh, students have also told me that they do not feel that their needs have been taken into consideration uh, by our college at least, and often by faculty as well. So I think it's imperative to create uh, cultures of care in the academy um, in medieval studies uh, between ourselves and our students, but also with each other. And a lot of the inspiration for this brief talk, talk and these ideas uh, actually comes from my work with mutual aid societies in Queens during the pandemic. It became clear very early on that the government uh, from the city level up was not doing enough and often was not doing anything to aid people who were losing their jobs, who couldn't afford food, uh, transportation when members of their household were still essential workers and clothing. So in many neighborhoods, including mine, uh, various mutual aid societies sprang up, including food pantries, uh, clothing and PPE distribution and community fridges. And there's still a lot of need for it today. And they're ongoing today. Um, so when thinking about our students, uh, one of the big things is to think about where are they coming from? Uh, for me, uh, you know, working in New York City um, at a community college, many are themselves essential workers uh, and many more are living with essential workers. Many lost multiple family members during the first wave and it's, it's ongoing. I just had another student who, uh, who just lost his father literally last week. Uh, others have gotten sick or have had to isolate from or take care of sick family members. And unfortunately, with um, the continuation of, of, um, of new strains of, of these uh, more, um, of these new strains of COVID, this is not, um, not necessarily going to change. Um, so yes, I'm from a community college, but even at an R1, I, I don't think you can generalize about students' experiences. Um, First-gen students might themselves have started working during the pandemic to help support their family. Uh, many have essential family worker members. Um, a lot of my students' families are in nursing, for example, although luckily now they are, um, at least they are getting vaccinated. Um, and many might not really have a place other than their bed to attend class. And so this is something to keep in mind for camera policies, et cetera. Um, for me, one thing that was helpful and that I've done to think about uh, was to think about how overwhelmed I felt during a lot of this process and about the deadlines that I've needed to get extended. And uh, honestly, the couple of times I just didn't get something in on time and did not send that email that I probably should have sent to my editors. Um, you know, just for feeling overwhelmed. And many students don't know how to reach out to professors if they need, they just don't know to do it if they need an extension. And that's especially true for uh, first-gen students. So um, just, you know, yes, a, a lot of our students are not, and, and increasing numbers of our students are not what was considered the stereotypical um, college student from, you know, middle class or above background who, um, you know, who can comfortably just be on campus and do whatever, um, particularly during the pandemic. And you don't necessarily know which students are from lower class backgrounds or have something else going on. Um, so, you know, being flexible with them and also really just showing them that, that you do care. Um, and if you are comfortable doing so, you can say, hey, you know, like this has been a, a tough week for me. And, and, you know, here's a little bit of why without over disclosing, I think makes them feel more connected, especially because, you know, they're so disconnected from each other. Um, the ones who are at home, I know some of you are in person or, or high flex, um, but the ones who are at home especially are not having any sort of place to really get together and we're all students including ha included having Zoom fatigue and everything like that. Um, ones who are at home also are more likely to be disabled as well. Uh, you know, it, it have some sort of high risk to not be on campus. So, it, it, you know, it kind of compounds things. Um, so that is a way for them to feel um, like there is some sort of connection. Um, this is also something that it's important that this this idea of a culture of care is important for faculties as faculty as uh, well as your you know your colleagues are fellow medievalists, um, you know especially for uh, adjuncts, faculty who are caring for children who are helping to teach their children or other family members, 
um, disabled faculty and unfortunately those who have gotten COVID and are now, now disabled via long COVID. Um, so it's just something to keep in mind and um, to, you know, try and give more time in general if there are deadlines if you're an editor and being flexible about deadlines because this also applies to students um and you know it, just to realize that many of us in addition to having more work and care duties have also had no in-person access to library uh, to uh, to libraries for over a year i have not set foot in a library since the very beginning of last march um so this really changes research timelines and ability. And it's often those of us with heavier course loads and fewer resources in our colleges who are also disproportionately affected, as well, of course, as independent scholars. Um, in general, I think giving alumni access to databases would be hugely helpful for you know, large R1 universities, although, yes, I've, I've heard their arguments against doing so. Um, but what we did actually in, uh, so I co-edited a, a Viator cluster on the global North Atlantic with Nair and also, um, and also with uh, Erica Weaver. And um, we started that project before the pandemic. And, um, but I, I was really insistent just that um, for equity purposes that we give, um, that we, we allow the uh, call for papers to circulate for a full month. So to be shared amongst different networks. Um, we also had it in, um, in multiple languages because we were looking to solicit, um, we had it in, in French and Spanish. We were looking to solicit uh, articles from outside of just um, uh, you know, the Anglophile world um, and particularly uh, Central and South America but also, you know, scholars who are working on, on uh, so we essentially used all of the languages, kind of official languages of North America, which includes Mexico and, and Central America. But um, so even before the pandemic, we had this in mind, um, also because we were soliciting, uh, we, we made a conscious effort to try and have early career scholars, independent scholars, and yeah, people from outside the United States. Uh, submit, um, our timeline was already flexible and really grateful for uh, to Viator that they did allow us to have that flexibility. Like I said, we started this before the pandemic and the issue will be out later this year. Um, but, uh, you know, and, and we checked in with our, um, with our authors a couple of times. There were authors who just you know, didn't respond and, you know, when gently checking in with them uh, and, and seeing what they needed, a, a lot of them were overwhelmed for various reasons. Yeah, like, you know, you're on a one year, you're in a one year um, visiting position and have to do this other thing and you get behind. Um, and then actually, you know, coming from the perspective of, well, what do you need to, to do this? And of course, if, if it's way too much, you know, can't, it's fine. Um, I, that was really helpful to a lot of people um, because I, I know that uh, so many of us are under pressure to publish, but it, allowing for these kind of kinder and more flexible policies um, also allows for, they're also juster policies or more just policies. Um, medievalists in precarious positions doing job applications, disabled medievalists, medievalists who are caregivers, medievalists whose mental health is suffering during the pandemic, we all get left behind if we try and keep going on with business as usual. And like Valerie was saying, it, you know, it's not just, well, those who can cut it then publish and publish quickly. Well, but then what about everyone else whose voices, you know, with, with a little bit of, of, of access and flexibility are writing things and, you know, can, uh, will, the, then all then all of this this scholarship does get just left behind because it's you know becomes impossible. Um, and finally, I know that teaching online in in these specific circumstances has not been ideal for many of us. It's not ideal for me um, for a bunch of reasons uh, that often have to do with infrastructure and you know the structures of our universities. Um, and many of our universities just told us just figure it out. Um, but I do think that it gives us the opportunity to rethink how we teach, uh, you know, how our course loads are distributed. 
especially online, um, how we teach online, thinking again about equity for both students and faculty who may be disabled or have caretaking obligations or otherwise need flexibility. I've been teaching online since 2011 and many of my students, many of my students actually, and up to today, um, outside of the pandemic, most of my students do take some online class, uh, mostly in person or half in person and some online classes. And it's specifically for um, flexibility or, um, or because of disability. And um, I actually, before the pandemic was trying to, I, I have a 4-4 course load and a long commute, and I was trying to move my course load to half online, um, which it will be next year because that's just, um, we're not going to be fully in person, but um, you know these. A lot of this didn't occur to to many people. The universities have often been promoting online teaching um, because it's cheaper, uh, honestly, and you know, and and there are various platforms that they use. But um, but we can really rethink about uh, how we do this in in terms of equity, and also um, rethink how we do conferences. Um, for the same reasons, and also in terms of economic justice as well, because it's very expensive to, um, to then go to a conference often. Classic, how could we have a Zoom meeting without someone talking while muted? Thank you so much, Nicole. Sorry about that <laughs> on my end. Um, I think that that way of thinking and encapsulating in that phrase, cultures of care is so, so valuable for us going forward. Thank you. Um, so many, so many topics raised. Um, we will hear next from Gina Brandolino. Gina, do you want to turn on your camera? Yep. Yeah. Can you hear Great. me? Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Excellent. Welcome. All right. Well, I know I didn't really need a title, but after I wrote my paper, I couldn't help myself. So I call this Gladly Teich a phrase many of you I'm sure recognize uh, from the description of the church, uh, the clerk in uh, the Canterbury Tales. In 2009, as a brand new assistant professor, I participated in a panel at the Medieval Academy called Pedagogy and Medieval Studies, Making the Transition from Student to Teacher. Discussion turned to anxieties about meeting publishing expectations while also teaching, and I shared that at my small liberal arts college, a couple articles or even just one was enough to earn you tenure if you were also an excellent teacher. Someone in the audience responded with a scowl and shaking head saying, well, I hate to hear that as if such standards were surely the death knell of medieval studies. The next year I followed my partner to the University of Michigan, my current employer and took a position as a lecturer. This is a teaching position. I'm required to do service, but not scholarship. It's full time. It's a stable job. I have a union and I teach on a five to seven year renewable contract. When I introduced myself to the university's medieval and early modern studies program coordinator, her first question was, are you tenure track? When I said no, she said, well, maybe someday as if I were waiting to be called up to the bigs. My tenure track partner tried to introduce me to the organizer of the medieval reading circle on campus. He ignored me and right there in front of me invited her to join and she's not even a medievalist. Even so, a few years ago, the medieval studies program at my alma mater invited both my partner and me to give talks. Over 50 people attended her scholarly talk while fewer than eight came to hear what I had to say at my talk on pedagogy in medieval studies. These stories are not exceptions. I love my job and have no desire to change it, but I do wish that attitudes about jobs like mine would change and not because it might mean that I have to endure fewer scenarios like the ones I've just described, which frankly would be nice, but far more importantly, because dismissive attitudes about jobs like mine damage academia in general and medieval studies specifically by devaluing one of the greatest tools we have at our disposal to prove our relevance and remain relevant, teaching. When I say, as I've said twice now, jobs like mine, I mean, of course, other non-tenure track teaching positions, both part and full-time, but also teaching forward tenure track positions like the tenure line jobs of our colleagues with heavy teaching loads at community colleges, 
small liberal arts colleges, and regional campuses. My focus in this brief talk is on the higher educational context, but certainly K through 12 teachers deserve mention here too. Because I teach at a large university and have a union, the material conditions of my job might be better than those of these jobs like mine, but something important unites us. For all of us, teaching is job one. That doesn't mean we're not scholars. Many of us do produce scholarship. Some of us might like to produce more and others might not be in interested in producing any. But that doesn't mean we're not producing anything valuable to medieval studies. A well-taught class does as much, if not more, to sustain and further the field than any single piece of scholarship. To my mind, a well-taught class is an act of scholarship. It can change perspectives, recruit new readers who may become colleagues, ignite new viewpoints, and in these ways, change the field. The lackluster or outright negative appraisals of academics whose first responsibility is teaching follows that old saw, those who can't teach. But in the past year plus, during the pandemic, when there has been a whole lot of can't, postponed conferences, nixed research trips, book and article projects stalled as we doom scrolled on our phones. Do you know what didn't stop? Teaching. When we were reduced to doing only what was most essential, we carried on teaching. That reveals how valuable we actually think teaching is. And it makes now a perfect time to challenge the dismissive attitudes our field displays about those of us whose primary professional identity is teacher and about teaching in general. Here at CARA, I realize I'm preaching to the choir for a uh, to a certain extent, but as somebody who has seen, heard, and felt in ways both subtle and gross how many members of our field devalue teachers and teaching, please permit me to suggest some changes we can make at various levels to acknowledge the value of teaching to medieval studies and take better advantage of teaching as we emerge from the pandemic. Some of my ideas are similar to those in CARA's supporting medievalists document, but with focus on teachers and teaching, indeed, CARA should consider making a document of best practices for this issue as well. But on to my suggestions, and there are five of them. Number one, make room for teaching and scholarship. Conference sessions are one place this can and does happen. Attend those sessions, help enrich the conversation, and along the way, your own teaching. But it should also be happening in journals and not just the pedagogy journals, but flagship, flagship journals like the Medieval Academy's own Speculum. Can you imagine a pedagogy article in Speculum? What does that say about the Medieval Academy? I'm sure all of you said no. Everybody I asked said no. Needless to say, books too, and not just the excellent teaching editions like the ones by teams, but books about teaching medieval studies like MLA's Approaches to Teaching series, which does include a few books on teaching medieval texts. Number two, consider teaching an, an important category of evaluation. Many universities, not just our ones, put little to no stock in teaching performance when evaluating tenure line faculty. Those of you who have evaluated tenure or promotion files for other institutions, how often are you sent substantial teaching materials to consider along with the rest of the file? If your department has conducted a search for a senior faculty member especially, did it ask applicants to provide teaching materials? With junior searches, this is more common. Why not with senior searches? What would we have to adjust to hold everyone who teaches to a higher standard or to any standard? What benefits would we reap from this adjustment? Number three, value teaching and graduate programs. As tenure line academic jobs grow increasingly scarce, more and more graduate programs are creating opportunities for their students to learn about and gain skills for alt academic jobs. But another alternative to the R1 positions that so many graduate programs consider to be the holy grail are jobs that center teaching. Those of you who teach and advise grad students don't disparage these jobs. Don't quash the interest your students have in them. Model good teaching, not as a tiresome chore, but an intellectual endeavor and a marketable skill. Cultivate opportunities for your students to develop as teachers, to talk about their pedagogy formally and informally, to write about it, write about it with them. Number four, tenure line folks get to know your non tenure track colleagues. Build on common ground, exchange stories about what you're teaching. Meet us not with pity, but solidarity. 
Make plain that you know that our jobs are not less important than your own is and are probably less supported, less well compensated and less appreciated. Acknowledge in your heart the truth that if we were all looking for jobs today with the job market as it is, any one of you could end up being any one of us. Number five, take your own teaching seriously and hold others to the same standard. Teaching gives us a chance to make an intervention on behalf of medieval studies. Because of our training and experience, we have a broad view of the field, but the grand majority of our students are encountering it for the first and perhaps only time. What we teach them is what they'll think about the Middle Ages. This is a unique opportunity every time with every student, take advantage of it. More than just in your own classroom though, challenge your colleagues when they dismiss or belittle the importance of teaching and conversations, whether they happen in the hallways or in meetings. Don't let teaching be the butt of a joke. I know many of you do care deeply about teaching, but so many of us work in contexts which take teaching for granted. Take it as the inconvenience we must manage while we also pursue the quote unquote real work of scholarship. See teaching as the poor cousin of scholarship. It's difficult to admit how quickly we look the other way when we encounter that bias, how immediately we excuse it or even support it. Let your return to whatever working conditions you return to next fall be an opportunity for you to recognize and invest in the teaching of medieval studies. Doing so isn't just an act of integrity, though it certainly is that. It's genuinely good for the field. Thank you for listening. Gina, thank you so much. I was busily scribbling notes. I think we all were. I think um, the suggestion of a, a similar parallel document for teaching is a, such a good idea. Um, I think you'll be hearing from us, <laughs> as they say. Um, so thank you so much. Excellent. Well, I, I do want to make one sort of administrative announcement. I'm aware that um, this was an ambitious program and time is ticking down. Um, Lisa, you tell me I can certainly stay a little bit longer beyond our three o'clock cutoff. And if other people want to stay to take a few more questions, um, that would be fantastic. Um, yeah, from, from my perspective, there's no reason we can't carry on. We're right. not, it's not the, you know, the Zoom's not going to automatically end okay. at a certain point. I just wanted to point that out to allay people's anxieties should they, if you have to go, obviously we understand that, but we do want to um, hear absolutely from Moira Fitzgibbons, and I apologize, Moira, if I if I pronounced your name wrong in the beginning, I feel like I may have, I apologize. Um, so Moira, if you can come, come to center stage and turn on your camera and join us. Are you here, I hope? Yeah. I am, yes. yeah. Hey, good, yes, I saw you earlier, good. Okay, great. Oh. All right, hold on one sec. Okay. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. All right. Fantastic. Um, okay. Uh, I'm going to move briskly. Um, as we ponder how to um, survive and thrive in a time of crisis, we don't need to start from scratch. The disability advocacy community has been modeling ways to do this for decades and has done so in particularly prominent ways in this past year. In this brief talk, I'll propose that we draw upon the knowledge we have gained in the pandemic era, as well as recommendations that disability advocates have been making for years to reshape our sense of how conferences and other organizational events work. Let's take advantage of new habits and technologies and tap into professional changes that were happening even before the pandemic to make conferences more accessible, inclusive, and vibrant. We medievalists are particularly well positioned to spearhead these changes in our gatherings. As many of the sessions in this year's MAA meeting have so richly demonstrated, we attend carefully to the oral, tactile, and visual qualities of medieval texts and encourage students to do the same. Let's apply this same interpretive agility to the form our forms our conferencing can take and build them into multiple modalities for participation. And here I'm also inspired by the digital epistemology session, as well as even just some of the informal conversation that's been happening in this session. Okay, as you know, the last 10 years have brought a growing interest in disability studies as an area of scholarly inquiry within medieval studies. And this slide shows just a partial list of important works that have been produced during that time. 
I have eagerly participated in these conferences and in these conversations and have incorporated them into my own research and teaching. For about seven years, I've taught an interdisciplinary first year seminar approaching disability studies from various angles and in different chronological periods. The course has allowed students and I to explore disability as a political identity, a medical category, a trope within literary and religious writings, and as a mixture of all these things. What I had not adequately thought about or presented to students prior to the pandemic was disability as an area of expertise. The contributions of disabled people to public responses to the pandemic has been succinctly articulated in a Twitter thread posted on March 11th of this year by user Kaylin M, who identifies as a queer artist, scientist, altruist, and trauma and disability advocate, among other things, and tweets it at Roll With The Punches. In the post, Kaylin enumerates 22 ways in which disabled writers have contributed crucial survival, survivorship strategies for it in a time of crisis. Kaylin's thread has also been posted on Alice Wong's Disability Visibility Project website. And here I'll also um, mention that the anthology Wong has written or has edited of first person narratives related to this project has been a fantastic resource in my first year seminar. It teaches beautifully and it would work well in a lot of different kinds of classes. Okay, so the subject areas covered in Kaylin's list range from, as you see here, tools to manage and cope with health anxiety, to tips for navigating healthcare and insurance, to life-saving instructions for all these different kinds of um, medical resources, and also sleep strategies for when time becomes an illusion. Kaylin further notes pointedly that this was all provided while being the community you were most ready to throw out the second you heard the word pandem we were here. Indeed, I hope we never forget the cavalier, supposedly reassuring references early in the pandemic to the idea that the virus was dangerous only to the most vulnerable or medically fragile. From the outset, disability advocates called out efforts to minimize the virus impact and associate it with groups that 21st century neo-eugenicists regard as expendable. Um, advocates' attention to bias and hostility in scientific, corporate, and governmental approaches to public health proved all too prescient as it became increasingly clear that Black and Brown Americans were experiencing much higher rates of hospitalization and death than whites, that incarcerated people were not receiving access to adequate treatment, and that all of these groups would receive slower access to vaccination than whites. Never was there more need for, as Kaylin puts it, infinite coping strategies and realistic tools for inca incapacitating isolation, depression, anxiety, and knowing the system will not protect you. This crisis and disabled writers and advocates foresight and guidance concerning it has many implications. Among them is a simple truth for educators. Academia needs the involvement of disabled artists, writers, scholars, and researchers not satisfy some altruistic commitment to inclusion, but because they know useful and important things about politics, culture, collaboration, community, and survivorship. So what are we going to do in order to ensure that medieval studies doesn't give access, but has access to, dis to disabled scholars' expertise? How are we gonna make our field appealing to disabled prospective graduate students through the way we talk about our fields of study and the way we configure our conferences and other events? What are the best ways to help disabled scholars achieve full-time positions and tenure? In the most practical and short-term sense, what will the Medieval Academy annual meeting for 2022 look like as well as other events that CARA, CARA members organize? At this point, for example, the MAA's call for submissions emphasizes the hope for an on-ground experience at the University of Virginia. There isn't any mention of remote participation in the current call on the website, but when I contacted Bruce Holzinger, the accessibility chair of the group, he sounded open to considering alternatives and suggested that things were still undergoing review. Now it seemed like a great time to question whether we should go back to physical presence as the single 
default method of communication within conferences, summer seminars, and other events. In place of this, I propose that we think of these gatherings as multimodal events involving a variety of potential forms of communication and involvement. What if participation via Zoom were an option in conference presentations, a box you would check next to the one that asks about AV needs? It's true that not every venue is equipped for Zoom in every room, but shouldn't we lead the way with that conversation and suggest that colleges and conference spaces take this need seriously? What if we kept up for the opportunities for digital conversation and meetups that have been a great part of the dialogue at this, this year's meeting? Many conferences have already started to move in this direction. For example, many scholars regularly live tweet particular sessions. The New Chaucer Society is, hoping, is hosting a digital exposition this summer as a forerunner to its 2022 Congress. Now would seem like a great time to make this part of our default discussions when organizing events. And who better than the Medieval Academy to lead the way on this at this particular time in its history? As with so many other universal design features, this set of changes could broaden accessibility to an audience wider than we might originally imagine. Just to take one example, I'll never forget what it's like to try to get around Kalamazoo when you're in your third trimester. Um, and I suspect every one of us here could recall scenarios in which it would have been a welcome option to participate differently in a semester or in a seminar or conference, whether the issue was funding, caregiving, illness, geographic distance, or other challenges. What could happen right now and without too much immediate stress would be for the Academy to mention in its 2022 call that it is open to remote participation as well as in person and that submitters could indicate which format would work better for them. Perhaps we could take some time today to brainstorm about strategies that have worked for you and your organizations in the past and about recommendations we might make in the future. Thank you. Moira, thank you so much. I think that's um, an incredibly important charge and really dovetails with um, what we spoke about uh, across this meeting in terms of accessibility, inclusion, um, thinking about uh, ways to move forward. And I think, you know, clearly, um, as Lisa and other people mentioned, unfortunately, none of it is free, but this seems like a perfect moment to think about applying for, for grants to do this kind of thing, to support this kind of initiative and scholarship. So um, very much appreciate that call. Thank you. Thank you all um, presenters for, for your papers and for um, papers, your comments, your impassioned uh, uh, thoughts about the future um, and ways to, I think, do and move forward differently to thrive in the future. Um, we have uh, a little more than 10 minutes. Those of us, uh, I will stay and Lisa will stay. Um, and I hope our presenters can, can maybe make themselves available um, uh, yes, visually as well. So let's go ahead and, and take a few questions. Um, these could be issues that maybe um, come out of the discussion beforehand, but that um, have a resonance in what you've heard here. Um, they could be in direct relation to this. Um, please folks take a few minutes to think about those things. And, and why don't you go ahead and, and put your question in the chat, Lisa, I think that's the best way. Although I'm aware I do see two hands that are up. So perhaps we've done this in other, other forums where we've called on people to ask their questions themselves. So um, yeah. I'll go ahead and do that because I do see hands up. The one last thing I wanna say is there's a lot of really useful information and details in the chat that's been open to everyone, um, not only about the benefits of MAA membership, but other um, strategies and ideas. So if people haven't taken a moment to look into the chat, uh, I, do, I do recommend that. Um, so I see Sarah, your hand is up. Um, Sarah McNamara, please go ahead and ask your question. Uh, yes, uh, thank you. Each of those uh, presentations was so powerful. I, I have so much that I'm going to think about. Um, but I want to ask um, about the term cultures of care. So the, um, the issue for me is, does that, what about that term in relationship to perhaps even uh, mutual aid societies? I think, so Nicole, this is for you. It's, you know, the kind of thinking you've done around this, cultures of care, care can too easily resonate with women and women's caretaking. And I'm just curious to know your thoughts on that. Would it be better to reframe it as cultures of justice or cultures of mutual aid or something like that? Yeah, that's a good, um... 
that, that is a that's an interesting comment. Um, because yeah, care is so gendered. Um, at CUNY, they are starting uh, one of the one of the big things that they they are using the term care in particular and talking about like care for students. Um, but I what I've been doing is yeah is is a little it has sort of jumped off from that, but is with my work in mutual aid and everything a little bit different. Um, so I was using more of like a kind of CUNY term, um, although I mean they are interested in justice and things like that. It's not so much the um, the, the very um, the the more um, horizontal um, idea of mutual aid. I mean, no, we we do have some power over our students, so it's you know we can't pretend it's completely horizontal, but at the same in in the same way. Um, it is removed from that sort of administrator administrative structure and that and those um, and and just these sort of structures uh, and that's that sort of um, where that mutual aid experience comes from. But yeah, I mean, um, cultures of justice uh, would yeah I, I think it's a really good comment and yeah it, it might be better to to think of to use another term other than care, but at the same time. Yeah, I'm I, I'm kind of of two minds about it because at the same time I, I do think it's important to think to think about care to not just apply care to women to 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 have um, you know one of these issues is that you know it it should be a, a value that that men also share as well um, and we've been having these issues at you know this is often brought up at our faculty meetings that yes the women are always the ones who volunteer for. Um, to note take and and you know bring things and organize and everything. Um, so at the same time, I do think if it um, if we do use that term and it, if there is more large spread buying into the term, then it it, it might destigmatize it in some way. So I mean, it's a really important point. I am just not entirely sure one way or another um, whether it's better to just use a word that. Um, is more palatable to uh, that is is not so gendered or to you know in that that care shouldn't be gendered. Thank you both. That really speaks to an issue that we had spoken about too on the executive committee that there is in our different locales, our different local communities, different sets of rhetoric and language, right, that our institutions use that we either have to adopt or respond to or be clever about. Um, so sort of how we <laughs> make that work while having other desires or agendas and issues sort of built into that, I think is um, really important for us to think about. Thank you. So Sean Gilsdorf, I see you have your hand up. Yeah, I mean, I was, I have to say that this is, um... I go to I, I I host and I go to a lot of conferences, but I have to say this is this panel has been one of the most like excellent one in terms of just like insight, you know. I and I just congratulations to all of you for for you know I guess holding our feet to the fire, but also for you know for saying stuff that a lot of us have been thinking for a long time, but haven't really been able to articulate because we're all just worn out. And I think that's something that I I, I really am struck by. But I, I I guess I was I'm very interested in this um, as somebody who organizes events at a, at a large university. I really really am am uh, excited by, but also daunted by the whole prospect of how of what a mo multimodal future looks like. And I guess the thing that's daunting about it is that even for places that supposedly have a lot of money and resources, I find many times multimodal is code in the institution for cheaping out. Um, that there's this idea that virtual is cheap and free. Um, and, you know, I'll just give an example from my own institution, Harvard. I was shocked and actually kind of, well, I was appalled, frankly, that many of the departments and, and, and parts of our university were actively telling their, uh, were telling people not to offer honoraria for virtual events that virtual events somehow were just kind of cheap and free and that we should just like, oh, isn't it it's easy for people now? We don't have to, they don't have to. And I and I just could not believe this. I never did it. I said, that's bullshit. And I just doubled our, all of our honoraria, um, which irritated some of the administrators. But I just wish, I think that mode of thinking that somehow that virtual is free, that people's time suddenly becomes, doesn't matter. And it's actually not worth anything. Uh, is not only, well, it's, it's, it's unethical, but it's also crazy. And so I'm kind of wondering how we, you know, I'm asking this for myself as, as the incoming CARA chair, how we can advocate and sort of make that case 
to our own institutions and centers to say, no, 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 you want to do this, you want to be inclusive, you want to be equitable, you want to have a more open community, that costs money. That there's, this is a, there's an investment to be made here. If you want to do something, a multimodal conference, it costs more actually than doing one that's just in person. You need resources, you need tech, you need rooms that are set to that, you need people who can kind of monitor chat. There's, there's a lot of inputs that have to be there. And I think that how we can best advocate for that with administrators to say, you know, this is not some freebie. You want to do stuff and you want to be inclusive. It actually takes an investment on your part. And I just find that many times administrators and people who control the purse springs, strings don't see that. They see the savings. They never see the investment. Um, so I think it's really helpful to hear your 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 comments because I think we do have to talk about this as a, as a as a question of equity and as a question of inclusion, and that this is where the, to be quite on you know to be quite frank to where we put our money where our mouth is because I think a lot of times we're just not doing that and I don't care whether you're at Harvard or if you're at a second at a state university or if you're at a, at a research center or whatever you are, I think that this is just not part of the discussion very often. So I, I really appreciate. Uh, particularly that that side of things, I think it does give me some you know some language that I can use uh, for making these cases, especially putting budgets together. So I just wanted to say that it's not really a question; it's more a, an expression of thanks. Great, thanks, John. Maura, did you want to? Well, I just, sure. I mean, one thing that we could all be strategic about, and maybe Cara could even um, compile a list of best practices. First of all, when I advocate for conferences to be multimodal, that doesn't mean everything needs to be completely multimodal. Like, I think of um, that book by James Lang, Small Teaching, where he's like, even small changes make a big difference. So it's not like everything needs to go all multimodal all at once. The other thing that's worked so far at my college at Marist is um, trying to strategically partner with staff in other areas of the college. So for example, I was able to pay an artist who was speaking about his work um, more than I otherwise would have been because he not only spoke with my class, but he agreed to an event with admissions um, where admissions was gonna bring in prospective students and listen to this artist and things like that. So I think um, also maybe aligning with our accommodations and accessibility offices and really you know, showing that this is a DEI issue um, mm -hmm. with all that that implies. Those are just two things that pop into my head, Sean, if that makes sense. Yeah, no, 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 it's great, thanks. Great, thank you. That's I think, immensely inspiring to think about and think about how to be creative and dealing with administrations among other things. Um, wonderful. So, um, Yana, Jana Shulman, will you, I th I, someone mentioned you had your question, uh, your hand up and I didn't see you because of my screen, so please. Yeah, thank you. First of all, I wanna thank everybody who spoke for a wonderful panel because it was really informative and um, it was, worthwhile and I thank you for that. And mine is also like Sean's, not really a question. I thank Sean for pointing out that virtual conferences are not free. Um, but what I actually wanted to say in particular thanks to Moira is that, you know, one of the reasons that we are going to be virtual, the International Congress on Medieval Studies in 2022 is because we want to, um, we know how to do it. We're, we're learning how to be virtual this year. We know we can make it work. And one of the major reasons outside of the pandemic that we want to make it work is precisely to figure out how to go hybrid in our reimagined 2023 that has both in-person, but also learning from what we will have learned from virtual um, meetings that we can incorporate, make, design, all of those verbs are important in this statement, um, the ability to improve access, uh, whether you're pregnant and navigating the, you know, Kal Kalamazoo or whatever the access issue is, it's very important to us as we rethink the International Congress on Medieval Studies for 2023. So uh, I just want to share that because I think it's important and um, thank you. 
Yeah, I, thank you so much, Jenna, for saying that because um, I, I think that mission is brilliant. There are many comments in the chat that are supporting that and, and, and saying so as well. And it's really helpful. I know, I don't know why they've come to me exactly, but I've gotten many questions about why Kalamazoo is virtual also in 2022. So I think we're all glad to have this information um, to, to explain this and, and to show that you guys are, are really going out there at the forefront of leading the way. So thank you, which to my mind is exactly what Kalamazoo is about, accessibility, opening up medieval studies. So that's that's wonderful. Well, thank you, Anne, for that, because I appreciate the shout out. And I've recruited a grad student, Chris Fidel, who was in my breakout room, who learned about medieval studies via medieval Twitter. So thanks to Chris and to everybody. <laughs> Good. So I, I see hands up, and I'm, I'm sorry if I haven't missed you. If you have a question, do put your blue hand up. That's easiest for me to see. But I see Tom, Dale, and Lisa. I know what wants to say something as well. Tom. I, I'm also responding to, to Moria's uh, appeal to a, a, a multimodal conference and just saying how it's worked for our medieval studies program is that, yes, we were adamant that we needed to have honoraria for online only events and we actually had to convince our dean that the anonymous fund that we use to fund our in-person conferences could also be used for for virtual presentations and so we continued to give our standard honorarium for all of our online people and i wanted to say that the great advantage is we actually attracted many more people mm -hmm. to our online medieval studies events than we had for our public lectures because they're often you know, at a time that not everyone can make it. But the great advantage was that we had many international speakers uh, whose uh, travel we could not afford to pay for normally. So I think, you know, accessibility works on many different levels. There's an economic aspect to it. Uh, there's disability issues. There's international participation. Um, and, and so I think, I, I think the idea of a hybrid conference and as incoming president, I can say that I will definitely support this uh, and bring this to the attention of, of the, the people of Virginia, which I think, as you said, they're already interested in this. Uh, but I, I think it's a, I can see it working for, you know, especially plenaries to be sort of prioritized for uh, for online access in addition, and perhaps also the, the archiving of these. Uh, to be resources, these presentations to be resources, um, thinking again about educational pedagogical uses of these materials, and then having strategically placed vir all virtual sessions amongst the in-person sessions. So I think these are all wonderful ideas and make a great deal of, of sense. And I think definitely the case can be made uh, for extra funding that it's going to take to do this properly, to do it well, because uh, as a couple of people have said, you, you, you can't just, uh, th this doesn't come uh, cheaply. And I think the this conference in Indiana has proven that it can be done very effectively online, very professionally. And I, I've been really impressed. I want to again, shout out to the organizers of the Indiana conference for doing this so well. But I definitely see this as being in the cards for future medieval academy meetings, that this is very important for spreading the word. And, and, and also, I think we might even consider graduated fees for those who attend in person as to as opposed to those who can do it online because again that just thinking about the possibilities for graduate students to participate uh, the costs to be in hotels etc as much as we all want to be in person i think this year has shown that there are certain advantages to uh, to this online env environment that we don't want to lose track of so thank you great thank you tom um, maybe there's another committee in the works here, Lisa. I'm really curious to hear what you, <laughs> where we're presenting you all these ideas, <laughs> your responses. <laughs> yeah. So, so my job as as the the CEO of the Medieval Academy, as it were, is to is to keep my eye on the bottom line, and that's the real challenge here, right? I think we've all we've all seen in the last year because we were forced to that there's real advantages to the virtual, that we've saved money, we've saved our, everyone's carbon footprint has been lowered by not having to fly all over the country, we're not having to stay in hotels. We miss one another, right? There's, that's certainly true. And I think if it, there are 
we're going to see in the next few years lots of creativity as people try and figure out these multimodal conferences, how to, how to do that in a way that's equitable, that makes everyone feel like they're a full participant as opposed to a second class virtual citizen of the meeting, um, but also to figure out how to do it in a way that doesn't make um, registration fees skyrocket, right? That's the real thing is trying to keep registration fees down while also providing these other modes of access. And the, the Medieval Academy meeting, because it's held on a different campus every year with a different group of a, a program committee on a different campus every year, it's a whole different set of challenges that there may be campuses that just aren't set up to do this. Uh, so there, there are lots of challenges, but I think it's really, really important that we think about them. I'll also say that we are gonna continue the webinar programs that we've been doing. So even as we start to transition back to in-person meetings, we are definitely going to con continue the digital piece. And we have made an absolute commitment in our budget to fund honoraria for uh, participants, including the participants today. You know, we, we made that decision that we would pay honoraria because this is real labor. This is not this is not nothing, right? I mean, you spend time thinking about what you're going to say and how you're going to present it, and it's labor that that should be um, that should be compensated. the The last thing I wanted to say, going back to um, uh, going back to our first presentation, going back to um, Valerie, is that the Medieval Academy, thanks in part to to Laura's leadership on our ad hoc committee on professional diversity. We've been working really hard to change the conversation within the Medieval Academy to not talk about in and out of academia, to not talk about alt ac but to talk about working beyond academia, to talk about working um, you know, off the tenure track, but still in medieval studies, that we're, we really want to be a, a bigger, a big tent where there's room for medievalists no matter where they are in their professional life. And, and I posted in the chat, we do have lots of resources and lots of opportunities that are available, specifically focused on providing access to resources, travel funding, publication subventions, lots of, of opportunities now for scholars all over uh, the professional spectrum. So if you if you are not a member of the Medieval Academy, please, please, please come and join us because we have so much to offer you. Uh, and we can't we can't make everything available to non-members. It's a member-based organization and and without membership revenue, we can't do we can't do our work. But we have just restructured our membership um, dues to try and make it more to, more affordable for people in fiscally precarious situations. So hopefully you can join us. Um, I'm going to put the link in the link in the chat. So check us out and and please, please, please join the Medieval Academy because we want you at, at the table. Great. That's all. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much. And I do think that there is um, the opportunity centers maybe detaching from universities in some way, getting some autonomy, getting more money and distributing it in different ways. I mm -hmm. think I think it's possible. You I think bet. there are possibilities. I shouldn't be completely pessimistic. <laughs> well, I, I think too, you know, Valerie, you know, as your, your talk made clear, like we just, we also need to be much more creative in how we think about how this works, how we do what we do, why we do what we do. Um, I don't know that we have any answers yet, but one thing that the committee has talked about is also thinking there are so many resources available for various things, but how do we, how do we help? In what ways can Hakara help make some of so fil facilitate access, right? That that should be one of our goals. That's actually harder to figure out the answer to than um, I wish it were. Uh, but it's it's on the radar as a as a way of thinking. So this is so helpful. Um, so I see Deborah Delahanis, you have your hand up too. Please. I do. Thanks. Um, I just want to say a few things. Back in. I think it was November before we knew what the pandemic was going to do. 
Um, and we were talking about, you know, whether we should go virtual and I was desperately hoping we would be able to be in person. We did talk about hybrid possibilities when we thought that maybe people would be able to travel. And we kicked it around with our conference coordinator who said, well, but and, and we said, but what about this and what about that? And how would the person speaking be able to see the audience? And, you know, what if half the audience was there, but what if most of them weren't? It was very complicated. And as other people have said in the chat, I worry about second class participation. But one of the things that's occurred to me all year, really, um, and at this conference is I'm sure that everyone has had the experience of going to a conference and hearing a bad paper, but then having a great conversation with the author, like in as coffee or a dinner or something like that. Um, and that is what a, a live conference does that a an online con even if we could figure out the problem of how to get people out of the zoom presentation rooms and into some other zoom room where conversations could continue which as kalani i think said earlier is you know really expensive but i'm sure that could be figured out um but it's still just i mean and we all know this right it's just not the same um and we know it's not the same um one of the things that I've been thinking about actually for years now is the three paper format at conferences, the 20 minute presentation and why that is the default. And, you know, this, because quite, let's be honest, you could, I would uh, many times, I would rather hear, read somebody's published article than hear their 20 minute talk and then meet them and talk about it. Um, I find roundtables generally, I've, I've thought this for years and years, that roundtables at conferences are much more intellectually interesting and stimulating than that. I know why people have to give papers. I know, of course, that it's valuable that, um, that you know, you get to go and give your 20 minute presentation on your research and then other people hear it. And, you know, I, I get it. I've done it. All of that. Um, but I think that in thinking about conferences, whether they're in person or online or whatever, that that is one thing that should be done. I also wanted to, I wanted to thank all the pre presenters today. And I was interested and mildly disturbed by the gendered nature of the conversations, just because, I mean, care in particular has struck me in my own institution as something that seems to be very female based. Um, culture of care caucuses and care discussions are almost all women, even, I, even in my department, which is a history department, which is half men. Um, and I agree with whoever said, you know, we have to find a way to frame that as something that involves everyone. I also would be interested to know, um, thinking of Valerie's presentation, how many um, independent scholars are women as opposed to men? who try to remain active in the profession. I mean, I'm interested in these gendered lines. And of course, medieval studies, I think, is more women than men um, anyway. So maybe it's, it's hard for us to figure that out. But I would be interested in, in having some more data um, about that, just to understand how the field is shaped and how we as an organization should shape it moving forward. Thank you, Deborah so much to um, think about and to keep in mind. Yeah, and I think especially following some of the um, comments in the chat, um, this is a remarkable moment to reinvent, rethink so many aspects of our field. And I hope um, that we will continue to do that. So um, Nahir, please ask a comment question. Okay, can you hear me? Mm -hmm. I. I'm having online issues, so I'm talking, I'm, there's two of me, but I'm here, yeah. So my qu question is for Gina, and it's about, you know, I first thank you for the list of best practices because I think they were really thought provoking and really important and, 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 I, and, and I'm really thankful about it, especially thinking about why is it that early career scholars, we need to think so much about teaching, but, you know, full professors, we don't, think about that so much you know and part of of my difficulties with you know with the teaching part is also that um you know 
we also know that evaluations of teaching are really gendered and racialized, and, and then that also becomes a problem, right? So I, I am in a majority minority institution, and I was doing, actually looking at the ratio of faculty to students. And in my institution, for every one white faculty, there's seven white students. And for every one faculty of color, there's 35 students of color. So not only is, is my teaching um, incredibly, the, the students don't have faculty that look like them or that might approach teaching in a way that that will help them. I mean, we know that 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 it's it's about a lot of things why we need people that that understand our backgrounds and 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 right. And so that's that's just not present. And so it does two things. It it, it it's an the amount of students that I have to work with is is so much more than my colleagues, but also even even these students of color and these students um don't see me, don't see my expertise in the same way as they see the expertise of my white colleagues. And so it also then creates a barrier in the teaching that I just, I'm still navigating as, because how do I, I, I know, I, I, I think it takes them so long to realize what they're gaining from having me as a teacher. Um, and by the time that they do, it's pretty late sometimes years later when they realize it and but also how how much work it is so like how do we also then incorporate into these best practices ways to make teaching more equitable for women and minorities that are having to struggle with other areas as well and so i wanted to sort of also add that to the conversation i mean you what you raise an excellent point and i i actually had uh, part of my talk address that and then it was too long and it got cut. But so I'm glad that you asked about it. Thank you so much. Um, let me talk about the way my union has organized um, my regular review, which I think um, they've developed a really fair way of getting teaching evaluated for all lecturers at University of Michigan. Personally, I think, and this is, a, when this happens, usually really bad things follow. When I say this, then people get really upset with me. But I think that academia would be better all around if all of us had to undergo regular five to seven year reviews and get looked at in, in whatever areas of specialty, um, be it uh, service scholarship uh, uh, and teaching uh, we're responsible for. It's definitely something that keeps me on my toes. Um, so I'll say that for a second. When, when I am reviewed, as I was actually just this uh, winter, uh, it is not just student evaluations that my evaluators look at. Somebody visits my classroom a couple times and takes uh, uh, objective, sort of as objective as possible, observatory notes and presents those notes to a committee that uh, looks at them. I'm also required to put together a portfolio of uh, syllabi, um, assignments, um, and uh, any anything else that I, you know, sort of any accompanying statements and a teaching philosophy so that student evaluations are just a third of what they're evaluating when they're evaluating me and uh, are informed by my own perspective on teaching, but then also what uh, other teachers see when they come into my classrooms. And this is, my union did this explicitly for the reasons that you're talking about, Nahir, um, which is the bias that comes with teaching evaluations. Um, the, uh, the difficulties of uh, teaching students, that's another area, and I, I should probably stop talking now, plus I don't have any really good ideas about that right now, but I recognize it that it's a super important um, super important topic and a, and a big problem. So thank you for this question. I hope that um, added something. Thank you, Gina. So I just want to say two things. I know we have gone over our three o'clock um, deadline. I see one more question um, in the chat or in, in, in Matthew, you've raised your hand and I do want to take your question. 
um, I know folks have to go at three thirty for sure. Oh, I, this could this could this could wait for another time. That, that's not a big deal. I was, I I wanted to second what uh, Nihir was saying and thank Moira for her comments. Like I just as, as a twenty second thing to say, uh, I wanted to sort of add that like what's difficult about. Um, about conferences and what's interesting about like these like kind of online uh, this online way of approaching conferences has been like conferences can often be intimidating and unwelcoming places for people of color. Like I think about that every single time I go to Kalamazoo, right? <laughs> like uh, it's a really really strange place to be uh, for a lot of different reasons. And these actually these uh, virtual spaces are a lot more accepting in a lot of ways. Anyway, that's it. <laughs> Thank you, thank you both, and and for, for all those comments. I think this is. Um, I was not kidding, Gina, when I said that we will <laughs> come back to you about that template. Um, and this, I think, just makes makes thinking about that so much more robust uh, and vital. So, so thank you. Um, a very quick sidebar question that that was asked that I had missed, which is, um, Gina, was your job this is like a point of information, but advertised as a medieval teaching position, or was it more broad than that? Yeah, I just saw that and I didn't know if somebody else was going to talk to me, so I didn't get to it. Um, I was, uh, as I met, talked about in the first uh, part of my talk, I was initially a spousal hire. Um, and so initially uh, I was given a one year contract and that was sort of, uh, so you, we hope you like us and we like you, but we'll check in with you in a year. Um, and at that point, after a year, my job was posted at the fraction that it, it is, um, you know, part in the English department, uh, part in the Sweetland Center for Writing, um, and that, that's how the job was configured. So no, it wasn't uh, a medieval teaching job, um, and though I do teach medieval studies, my, my job isn't strictly medieval. Thank you, thank you. Well, I think I see no more questions. Um, and again, we, we've, I think it's a, a good thing. It's a compliment to us and to our panelists that we've gone over time and to all of you for staying uh, for so long to hear this conversation. So I just wanna um, say just two quick things. One, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by um, the wonderful panelists and comments that there's so much to think about here. And also by the, the ethical component of all of these conversations, the importance of making space for the creation of knowledge, different kinds of knowledge, and finding a way to incorporate that uh, into our changing and differently oriented venues of gathering, whether it's teaching in a university, whether it's outside the university, whether it's at a conference and the changing nature of the conference. And I just really hope that these ideas and interventions stick with us as we move forward in the world as individuals and as part of this um, awesome and fundamental community that is the MAA and CARA that is a slice of that. Um, thank you so much to our four panelists, um, Gina, Moira, Valerie, and, and oh, brain working, brain working, I apologize, Nicole, sorry, <laughs> the end of a long day. Thank you for so much. Um, this was really wonderful. And thank you to Anne, who is stepping yes. down as chair of CARA after six years of amazing leadership. So, so yep. grateful to you, Anne. Thank you all, and thank you, awesome CARA committee going forward. Have a lovely Sunday afternoon, everyone. We'll see you in the future. Thank you.